afternoon from London, uh, but I know we have people joining us from all around the world today. So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are joining us from. And welcome to today's webinar on the topic of Money for Net Zero, how finance ministries can help support global climate action. My name is Siobhan Benita. I'm a former UK civil servant, and I'm delighted to be chairing this webinar on behalf of Global Government Forum, which is a publishing house that serves civil servants all around the world. Now, in terms of today's topic, tackling action on climate change requires coordinated global action and coordinated global funding. The COP26 conference in Glasgow took steps towards delivering the 100 billion climate finance goal, $100 billion climate finance goal by 2023. But the Egyptian presidency of the forthcoming COP says that it's essential for the conference to make significant progress on actually providing these funds, as this is vital for delivering the climate action that countries and financial organisations have signed up to, and to building trust between developed and developing countries. So in this webinar, we're going to be looking at what governments, at what central banks, what financial institutions are all doing to provide this funding, the funding that's needed to move nations closer towards their net zero targets. Where is the best practice? What investment incentives are being put in place? What more needs to be done? And much, much more. We have a really great uh, panel of three speakers with us here today. And in a moment, I'm gonna introduce our three panelists, but this is also your opportunity as our audience to put your questions to our speakers. So on whichever device you are using, you should see somewhere on that device a Q&A uh, button. Please use that Q&A button at any point from now on to message in your questions. And once we've heard from our panelists, then we'll get through as many of those questions as we can before the end of the webinar. So in terms of our three speakers today, first we will hear from Sa Sara Tolonen, who is Financial Specialist at the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action in the Ministry of Finance in Finland. Finland has been the co-chair of the coalition ever since its establishment in 2018. Through her role in the coalition, Sara is involved in working groups on green transition finance and the OECD pilot project on carbon neutrality, neutrality which aims to develop governance mechanisms to respond better to uncertainty. Then we will hear from Christoph Baumann, who is Envoy for Sustainable Finance at the State Secretariat for International Finance in Switzerland. In this role, Christoph leads the Swiss government's sustainable finance activities, ranging from negotiations in multilateral bodies to domestic regulatory projects. Before joining SIF, Christoph worked in executive positions at financial institutions and fintechs. And then we will hear from Matthias Frumering, who is head of delegation to the UNFCCC at the Ministry of Environment in Sweden, where he leads climate diplomacy efforts across government. His previous roles include head of EU single market, head of EU policy, and head of strategic communications in the Swedish Ministry for Foreign Affairs, as well as EU advisor in the Prime Minister's office, and he's held postings in Budapest and Brussels. So I'm sure you'll agree with me that we really do have a very expert panel with us here today. As I said, please do take this opportunity to message in your questions and we'll get through as many of those as we can um, once we've heard from all of our speakers. But now I'm going to invite Sarah to give us her opening comments. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here today to, uh, to discuss this important topic before COP27 this year. Um, so today I'm here in two different roles. First, I'm a civil servant uh, working in the Finnish Ministry of Finance, and I'm also a member of the co-chair team in the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action. So I could first talk a bit about Finland and our goals when it comes to climate finance. So Finland's climate finance is part of a joint commitment by developed countries to support developing countries' climate action with 100 billion US dollars uh, from 2020 to 2025. So during this period, Finland will support climate action in developing countries with a significant financial contribution of approximately 900 million euros. Finland's international climate finance as a whole 
will be reported to Parliament annually in connection with the newly introduced annual climate reports. So then a bit uh, on the numbers. So our international climate finance has increased nearly twofold during this government term compared to the previous term. And the planned funding will continue at an annual level of approximately 200 million euros until 2026. So we've definitely improved on this in Finland. Then I'd like to mention the balance between mitigation and adaptation financing. So our funding consists of grant-based, investment-based and loan-based assistance. It's estimated that as set out in the government program that this, uh, from this year onwards, the grant-based climate finance flows will be equally split between adaptation and mitigation. So this is very important to bridge the gap for adaptation financing that currently exists. And then I will talk about the coalition. So through working in the co-chair team in the coalition of finance ministers for climate action, I've had the opportunity to look at the issues of mobilizing climate finance more broadly. So for finance ministers, climate finance means that uh, we ensure the financial markets function properly. It's also about creating an en enabling environment. Uh, it's also about making sure that the international ecosystem of actors works well, especially the MDPs. And lastly, we need to ensure that the use of public finances is effective and credible to address climate concerns, both from mitigation and adaptation angles. So what's currently needed? I, I see that there's an urgent need to enhance know-how, capacities and involvement of the finance ministries. The international community and partners, they, they need to step, step up their efforts um, to support training and capacity building of finance ministries. And the coalition with its 78 member countries and 25 institutional partners is trying to contribute by finding tools and practices to enhance the current system so they can better serve mobilizing finance. And lastly, I'd like to highlight that the 100 billion annual goal must be reached and the access to financing needs to be enhanced. So the coalition is not negotiating about this, but we could play a role and contribute in many ways when it comes to this. So what can the coalition actually do? So first, as I mentioned, we have 78 members that represent different levels of development, climate challenges, and also geographic backgrounds. So in the coalition, we work together, we learn to understand the policy challenges and we help each other. And secondly, at a practical level, we work to ensure better identification and managing the risks in the recipient countries. We also promote the use of better financial instruments such as blended finance tools and green bonds. Um, third, the coalition is all about mainstreaming climate into economic and financial policies. So careful economic and financial planning leads to transparency, financial stability, and better credit worthiness. Investors and donors value this, and they also need transparency about where the money is flowing. So we need to go deeper to the incentives, have more country-focused approaches, and ensure that our financial systems themselves work efficiently to mobilize climate finance. This way, we could achieve more with the existing resources. And Lastly, I'd like to mention that in my opinion, finance ministries are ready to be more involved, but we need to cooperate more efficiently together, both at national and international levels to ensure that we maximize the climate impact of our financial inputs. That's all for me. Thank you. I give the floor back to you. Thanks so much, Sarah. A really great way to start. I think you've, you've raised a lot of issues that I think we can um, delve into a bit deeper uh, throughout the conversation. but. First, interesting to hear your views on, on Finland, as you say, like increasing their climate finance themselves domestically, um, reporting annually to government as is required now, but also that split in mitigation and adaptation uh, financing as well. And we had a, a webinar recently on adaptation, which tends to get overlooked, I think now in the wider conversations about mitigation. So interesting you raised that up front. 
And then really interesting to hear about what the coalition of finance ministers um, do, uh, all of the stuff you said there about sharing ideas, good practice, helping to manage risks, mainstreaming climate into economic policies. Um, but a, a kind of plea there from you that both at national level and at international level, there's more even that finance uh, ministries could be doing to get involved uh, in the um, climate change uh, uh, broader kind of narrative. Thank you so much, Sarah, for setting the scene with that. Now, Christoph, I'm coming over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present uh, here uh, the work of Switzerland, but actually I want to frame it much more in the work of the G20 uh, finance track. I think um, uh, there were some key developments there, both last year and uh, this year. So the G20 finance track consists of both finance ministries and uh, central bank governors. And uh, last year on the Italian presidency, the, the, the sustainable finance study group was upgraded to a working group. And uh, the key work of last year was to establish a G20 sustainable finance roadmap. And that has really succeeded in building a structure for future presidencies to work um, on and to progress uh, more efficiently and effectively without starting each year uh, from scratch, so to say. And the second key work last year, I would say, is the, the broad support and um, on um, decision-ready climate disclosures. So we had the work of the TCFD being upgraded as part of the Inter institution, uh, International um, Sustainability Standards Board and really the welcoming of uh, the G20 and, and the G7 of that work was of key importance, I believe. And now this year, I would look at the, the main work of the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group was on the one hand around developing a framework for transition finance. And there, I think there was really a broad consensus that there needs to be a whole economy approach. So it's really important that whatever framework or whatever recommendations the G20 comes up with, it needs to be of so, such sort that incentivizes the whole economy to transition to net zero by mid-century or whatever um, um, net zero goal uh, the various years jurisdictions um, chose to set. And to us, uh, Switzerland, this means as much forward-looking um, transparency as possible. And we see this very much in the context also of um, this year's discussion on Article 2.1c of the Paris Agreement, meaning of making financial flows consistent with a pathway to, uh, towards low greenhouse gas emissions and climate resilient development. And we need transparency on what that means. I think there's not yet a global consensus on what that means. And I think the G20's work this year has really pushed forward that uh, discussion of how such transparency framework could look like. I think there, again, it really base, uh, builds upon the TCFD recommendations, which, um, by the way, Switzerland is, is this year making mandatory across the entire economy. Um, and it also builds on top of the next agenda point, which is actually the credibility of transition plans, and particularly the credibility of financial institution transition plans and commitments. Um, I think there, it's, there was a very broad consensus within the G20 that, that any financial institution commitment towards net zero needs to be assessed and needs to be made credible if, um, or it needs to be ensured that it's credible. And I think their chief ends plays a very important role. So the Glasgow Financial Alliance of net, uh, for net zero, which was established around COP26, that brings together all major net zero um, alliances uh, um, from the banking, asset owner, insurance and asset manager initiatives and really build on common work to progress and to ensure mo um, uh, monitoring and, um, as, um, and credibility of that. I think key recommendations of the G20 in that regard are the inclusion of scope three where possible. So of having the entire upstream and downstream emissions part of the credibility um, of the net zero commitment of a company, uh, of a financial institution. And the other key development is actually related to GFENS, but slightly independent of it, nevertheless, it's the establishment of a net zero data public utility established by the Climate Data Steering Committee, um, of which Switzerland, amongst other countries, are a member of. So there we really establish until COP28 next year, we will establish a platform of company emissions, of company targets, of financial institution emissions and financial institution targets, all open access without IP related to it and for free of charge so that both financial institutions can use it to, to build their transition plans, but also for NGOs and civil society to really assess the credibility of the various transition plans. I think this open data initiative is absolutely key to enhance the work GFENS is already doing. 
Um, the third major topic this year was on scaling sustainable finance instruments with a focus on um, improving accessibility and affordability. So there, I think that the, the key question in the room was, well, blended finance seems very important. Why is there so little of it? And I think this is a topic which I would expect um, a future presidencies of India and also Brazil at the year after uh, in 2024 to really have a focus on. So how can we really mobilize private sector capital? Is there a need for de-risking uh, facilities uh, where the government or the finance ministries uh, play a role? And the, the last part of the work, and that's actually not to be neglected, is reporting on progress. So I think the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group really built a certain coordinating role for itself, uh, coordinating the work of various international organizations. And it's really important that there needs to be a monitoring of that work against the roadmap and that was established last year. And I think that is really being established this year. And uh, we see much more and more G20 members than also voluntary report their domestic progress, which is equally important, I believe. So I do believe that finance ministries have recognized the importance of their, of their role. As, uh, as Sarah mentioned as well, the coalition plays a very important role. Other initiatives such as the International Platform Sustainable Finance plays an important role as well, but so does the G20. I think there we really see a momentum in that regard. Uh, so much about that. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Christoph. Um, great to have that slightly different perspective then to bring in uh, what the G20 have been doing and um, interesting what you said at the beginning about the um, kind of the impact that effective governance can have on really driving progress so bringing together kind of the G20 finance ministers with central bank managers and then having that kind of plan for how all that is governed. And then the three things you mentioned there, the framework for tradition, uh, transition finance, the credibility of transition plans, especially um, looking at the financial institution, um, their commitments there and how those can be monitored and make sure that they are credible as well. And looking at the missions across a kind of project and across an organization. And then, as you say, they're looking ahead, the increasing kind of focus that's going to be placed on blended finance and finance ministries, I think, increasingly realizing the role that they can play on, as Sarah mentioned as well, creating that enabling environment and incentivizing um, kind of private uh, financing into kind of future projects. Thank you so much, Christoph, for giving us uh, that perspective. And now, Matthias, I'm coming over to you. Thanks so much, and uh, great to be with you in this conversation today. Um, and uh, greetings from Stockholm. We have a new government in place today, so uh, uh, I'll be speaking hopefully under the, the guidance of what, um, what the new govern, government also has uh, um, uh, in, in that, uh, taking in their direction. Um, and a really, really useful topic to, to have this conversation on what finance ministries um, uh, can help to support global climate action. And I think I'll, I'll pick up on that uh, to start with. I mean, even though I'm in actually in the Ministry of Environment, um, we have sort of across government um, a quite a sort of a, a process for integrating climate action in our national budget and planning processes. So, for example, both when we're elaborating the state budget, but also when we are elaborating uh, new legislation, um, there is sort of a, a step guide basically for all. Uh, government employees on how to integrate climate action into that those processes and it actually entails not only climate and environment but also gender and uh, how specific actions contribute to jobs and growth so any kind of you know budget proposal which would be put forward also needs to in include that analysis on the impact on climate and environment so the, sort of that's just sort of as one way of um, integrating climate action into the work of government as a whole. And I think that sort of speaks very much also to what Sarah highlighted uh, as to the work of the coalition of finance ministers. And then, of course, we would have uh, specific actions within the state budget uh, in terms of investing in climate action. Just to give one example where government has been providing funding to what we call the hybrid project, where um, three Swedish companies have come together to de develop uh, methods for producing fossil free steel or green steel. Uh, so in that sense, sort of the, I mean, the state has or the government has been contributing financially also to that uh, particular project as an example of how uh, we're integrating climate action into the work of, of the government more generally. But of course, in, in, a, in addition to the budget, I mean, one of the key uh, tools of government is, of course, sort of setting the regulatory environment more generally. 
Um, and just to sort of to give a couple of, of examples from what the Swedish government has been doing, um, already a couple of years back, we set uh, the, the climate policy framework where we set 2045 as our target date for being climate neutral at the latest. Um, and I mean, as, as Christoph also outlined, that sort of provides a platform also for the transformation of the economy as a whole towards that goal, um, which then gives the kind of clarity needed for various actors in society in terms of uh, the transition that we're doing. Uh, as part of that kind of package, we also have the climate law and the climate policy council was established, which has as its mission to monitor both actions by government and parliament in terms of delivery on the climate policy framework. Uh, so each, each year the Climate Policy Council comes out with a report presented to government in terms of what has been achieved and how far we are uh, in terms of implementing our, our climate goals. Also, each new government has uh, is obliged to present what we call a climate policy action plan to parliament within the first year of coming into office. So that's work which is being taken forward now with the new government having taken office today, then of includes, includes also, of course, uh, actions across government, including then uh, uh, actions spearheaded by the ministries of finance. Maybe just sort of to mention a particular uh, regulatory area uh, for, um, when it comes to climate action, um, and that is carbon pricing, uh, which we would see as, as, and which we often hear also from Swedish business actors when, you know, when they're asked what would be the most efficient global uh, tool to accelerate climate action and we often often get the answer that they would want to see a global price on carbon uh, but in, in sort of in the absence of that we think it's useful for all countries to implement those kind of measures which which uh, uh, would ha would lead to all countries having some kind of um, national price on carbon let me also just mention an initiative which uh, was, was launched a couple of years ago called the Fossil Free Sweden Initiative, where the government has been working with, with various uh, other um, society actors, including business actors, uh, to develop um, what we now have 22 different roadmaps for the transition in various sectors, so steel, cement, transportation, aviation, and so forth. And those roadmaps, of course, then so the set the targets within those specific sectors on how uh, to to ensure that we're driving towards that um, the transition towards that zero. So all of these sort of various elements is also what we would bring then to the global conversation in terms of our climate diplomacy, both sort of bilaterally but also in relation to uh, partners within the UNFCCC. So uh, based on sort of the policy that we have set, we engage in a policy dialogue uh, on sort of how to implement the Paris Agreement on a national level but also how to secure the finance for implementing that policy. Development finance, of course, is a key element for us, where we have, um, you know, basing our um, development finance on the needs and priorities set forward by developing countries in their dialogue with us as donors. Uh, and as for example, as a, as a result of that, almost 50% of our bilateral climate finance is geared towards climate adaptation, uh, which we see then as a result of um, developing countries prioritizing um, finance for climate adap adaptation in their dialogue with us as donors. Um, we're also making here again, sort of integrating climate action throughout our development cooperation. Uh, so in any kind of strategy, they would normally include some element also when it comes to, to climate action. But not only development finance, also export finance, where we've sort of geared that to be towards being fossil free. So the support that we provide to Swedish enterprise when doing business in other countries is also very much geared towards uh, supporting the transition to uh, net zero. But ultimately, I think uh, as also has been raised, I mean, public funds will only go so far when it comes to supporting the transition. So what we're also keen to be doing is working with partners sort of both on a Nordic, European and global level to accelerate the transition to having regulatory environments which incentivize the um, deployment of finance to, to support the implementation of the Paris Agreement, be it through uh, various types of taxonomies or other uh, regulatory approaches. Um, and, and Christoph mentioned, for example, the International Plan Platform on Sustainable Finance, which is one tool then for sort of comparing notes on how to develop these kind of taxonomies. Mm -hmm. And finally, sort of our 
in addition then to the policy dialogue finance, we also have the innovative technology which is needed and to accelerate the transition. And here we, we hope to be um, presenting those kind of options and opportunities for, for countries to, to, to implement those kind of innovative technologies needed to accelerate in the, uh, the transition to net, to net zero nationally, be it in you know, the, the various kinds of sectors that, that a country would have in order to reduce, uh, reduce emissions um, in that particular country. So overall, our approach uh, would be to highlight both sort of the urgency of climate action given what the IPCC not least tells us that we need to cut emissions in half by 2030, but also highlight the opportunities that we see in terms of what uh, climate action brings in terms of new jobs and, and economic growth. Uh, and the opportunities that we see now for countries to be working together to accelerate the transition uh, um, in order to reach the, to make sure that we limit temperature rise to, to 1.5 and, and at the same time creating more uh, resilient uh, societies. And then here I, again, I think finance ministries really have a key role to sort of both setting the, the internal procedures in place uh, to deliver on climate action and then of course working together with partners globally to uh, to share best practice and and make sure that we can deliver on our Paris targets uh, jointly. I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanks so much, Matthias. Uh, great to see get a bit of an overview there of uh, lots of things that you are doing in Sweden, both on the kind of policy front, but also on the legislation front. So how you are kind of um, ensuring that um, officials look at the impact on of cl on climate of anything, any new legislation, of any new kind of um, policies that have budgetary implications, for example, so how that is a requirement, um, how uh, government is uh, helping to fund some innovative projects, like you mentioned the hybrid project on looking at fossil free uh, steel. So that's one way that using finance to kind of um, foster innovation in this, also setting some of those regulatory um, frameworks as well, uh, overall having that target of 2045 um, to be carbon neutral. Um, but then um, coming back to similar to what the others were saying as well, that the, private, the public sector can't do this on its own. You also need to be using finance ministries and other to in, others to incentivize some of the private investment. Um, and I like the way you phrase it there at the end, that this is um, a chance both to show the urgency, but also the opportunity of kind of taking a, a more greener kind of sustainable action on this and the role that finance ministries can play there in highlighting some of those opportunities. Um, really, really important. You mentioned global, uh, the global carbon pricing. We might, I imagine, get some questions on that as well, because that's something that comes up quite regularly yeah, in these webinars. So just a reminder to the audience, please do get your uh, questions coming in. Any questions uh, that you like to our three speakers there. We've had their introductory remarks. Thank you very much for all of those. Um, I have a question I'm going to um, put back to all of you, I think, and this is something um, that has come up in webinars that we have done about kind of the post-COVID um, stimulus packages and that the post-COVID kind of build back better um, narratives that we've heard from lots of uh, countries um, in recent times. And my question to all of you, thinking about how plugged in, as you were saying, Sarah, there's more to do to plug in finance ministries, maybe across government more broadly. Do you think countries have missed a trick in some of these big kind of stimulus or recovery packages in not making those green enough. Um, and I think there have been some statistics put out that actually of the, that kind of those big spending commitments uh, of countries that actually a relatively small amount of that has been committed to uh, green recovery projects. So I'm gonna come back to you, Sarah, because we haven't heard from you for a while, but do you think there's more that could have been done in the kind of post COVID recovery world? I could comment this on a general level. I think at the moment we have huge constraints in our public finances after this multiple crisis. So, of course, what we would need is a systemic change and we would need to change regulations and our tax systems. But um, for these changes to occur, we need strategic and more long-term thinking, which I think we are lacking at the moment. We need to increase that, that for sure. Um, so yeah, I think I'm, I'm only speaking uh, 
uh, about the European level, I think Europe with its bid for 55 package and, and the current geopolitical context as well, I think, I think we are moving forward uh, with a faster pace at the moment, especially when it comes to energy transition. So, so yeah, I haven't seen the exact numbers about the stimulus package, but um, yeah, I think there's definitely a momentum, which is good and I'm happy to see it. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Christoph, your uh, thoughts on this, and then Matthias, I will come to you as well. Christoph. So having missed the trick, absolutely. I think that's, um, it, it was observable in, in many countries, including in Switzerland, that as soon as there's a crisis, you have the short-term thinking and let's not make the loans conditional. Let's just give out the loans to the economy. They need to flow through. Let's not make them conditional on climate change. It's a huge missed um, opportunity. And you see it now also with the energy hike. Um, coal plants are firing up, uh, subsidies are reintroduced. Um, it's coming from the same countries that have been strong proponents of carbon pricing, like also Switzerland. So, so I think it's, it's, it's again a missed opportunity to some degree. In other areas, um, we see the energy price being used um, correctly. But as the IMF points out at any opportunity, such high energy prices is a huge opportunity to actually establish global carbon prices when the energy prices um, start to fall again i'm not too hopeful on that front to be honest mm -hmm. yeah. so i think i agree with matthias uh, point um each jurisdiction has has uh, has to move forward with domestic carbon prices as is doing switzerland with its increasing its carbon price since early this year to 120 dollars um, on heating fuel but obviously that doesn't cover all the co2 emissions yeah thanks christoph Matthias, I can see you nodding there. Do you agree, Christoph, that we missed a trick, I think? I, it's, it's probably fair to say that we did. I mean, it, it's interesting uh, how, how quickly things move and change. I mean, when we had this conversation two years ago, I mean, at the start of the pandemic, at least from a climate perspective, we were quite engaged in the green recovery, as we called it, and sort of, I mean, there were calls from the UN Secretary General at quite early in the pandemic to make sure that we were using those funds in, in exactly that way to, 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 to accelerate not only sort of Paris targets, but the SDGs more generally. Um, and as we sort of moved along, I mean, there were the estimates from the IMF, I think I, I haven't got the latest figures, but I mean, the one I saw were sort of 16 trillion US dollars being allocated I mean, primarily by, by G20 countries, but still to um, sort of to alleviate the, the economic consequences of, of the, uh, the pandemic. But then again, I think also in fairness, uh, I mean, it's, it might be difficult sort of to make the totality of those funds geared towards climate action, sort of if you have unemployment benefits, for example, uh, or you, know, you they need to be, you know, they need to be allocated to to those in need, and and some of those might not be working sort of in sectors which are conducive to climate action. So of course there is a balance which needs to one needs to strike there in terms of how those funds can be used. Um, but I think it's also worth highlighting from an EU perspective how these sort of the funds set aside within the EU are very much geared towards not only the climate transition but also the digital tr transition. So sort of the the so-called twin transitions, as they're called. Mm. And for example, within the new EU budget for, for this period, I mean, I think it's 30, 35% of that budget is gear, being geared towards climate action. Uh, and the more we can sort of, at least from my perspective, work in tandem with the digital transition, I mean, much of what you're seeing in the digital transition also facilitates the green transition. So yeah. making sure that we are spending our sort of fund funding for those twin transitions will uh, hopefully accelerate climate action, not sort of only within Europe, but also provide an example to, to our global partners and how we can make best use of those funds. Thanks, Matthias. I mean, sticking with this kind of issue, do you think some of the um, barriers to um, maybe a, a more holistic approach? So as, as Christoph was saying, sometimes when crisis hit, civil services tend to revert back to short-term thinking. They also tend to revert back then to becoming defensive within their departmental silos. And they're kind of all fighting for pots of money uh, in very kind of you know, historic ways that they've done in the past. Do you think some of those cultural and structural issues within civil services, just the way they are set up, 
are barriers to um, to us doing more in terms of kind of financing of, of green uh, projects, the financing of the more sustainable future, because then the finance ministries have to play this very traditional role uh, when some of these crises hit. Sara, your thoughts on kind of the civil service structures and governance arrangements and whether they're a barrier to some of this change? Yeah, I, I do think this problem absolutely exists everywhere, the silo problem, e even here in Finland. Um, but I think now it's it's ever, ever more important that we invite the finance ministers in the picture and think more horizontally and and more cross sectorally. So so yeah, if, if we want to bring the Paris Agreement into reality, we need to have finance ministers both at domestic levels, but also in the in the international climate uh, climate COP context. We need to we need to bring finance ministers in because they at the end of the day they have the power when it comes to the budget and the investments and mobilizing the funds. So. So I think we are moving towards that, recognizing their role in this big picture. So, Christoph, what's it like in Switzerland in terms of those internal structures and when so, get in the way sometimes of? Actually, I have a slight different experience. I would say both the COVID relief measures, but also very similar to that dynamics um, when it comes to the, the Russian sanctions, you see a huge collaborative um, effort by various departments, kind of cross departments. Um, you have then cross department uh, working groups on these um, issues and it works really well. I think the, the issue is more um, in both uh, topics, those involved are working day and night. And the issue at hand is already of such complexity. You don't want to add additional complexity to it. It's, it's already a risk in itself. Um, and then you don't add the complexity of making it conditional to, to a more long-term goals. I think that's the main issue that, that makes it very easy to, to kind of push away any interest that says, let's, let's bring in some long-term thoughts into this, um, into this thinking. Yeah, thanks, Christoph. Matthias, I'm going to ask you this, and in, in light of, I think there have been some recent announcements in terms of departmental changes in Sweden that are going to take place. So do you think those kind of departmental changes will help to connect departments in a more strategic way? Thanks. I, I, I shouldn't sort of be prejudging what the new government has has sort of set yeah, out for. I did for hear us. it. I did hear it on social media, so it might not be. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's 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 all official. But um, I mean, in terms of results, uh, we're of course eager to see how sort of we can uh, make sure to deliver on the new government's priorities. But uh, the just sort of to 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 put that out there. I mean, the new. Uh, we, I mean, I was, I was now in the Ministry of Environment, but now we are uh, forming a Ministry of Climate and Enterprise, I guess would be the, the English um, translation. Uh, so we're sort of where, and that ministry will then be working on climate, environment, energy, and sort of enterprise uh, business uh, uh, issues. So, uh, I mean, I think, and I, I think that speaks very much to your question, sort of. Yeah. Uh, how to sort of to structure government is uh, really one key element of how to deliver also on our climate targets. Yeah. Um, so I mean that's that's one issue sort of on the the on the structure. But then of course also the the working procedures which you would have. Um, yeah. What kind of met methodology would you apply? You know the kind of checklists you you set out in terms of what you as a civil servant need to look into when you are designing either a new you know, a legislation or budget proposal. Uh, and so ensuring that kind of capacity within your government structures, uh, I would say personally at least, would, would be sort of one element of, of accelerating climate action. Then of course, it's also very much sort of um, an issue of leadership, you know, the, how, how strongly does uh, climate action uh, it, how strongly is that reflected in uh, the priorities or you know within your hi hierarchy uh, and yeah. your structures and how sort of much are you as a civil servant expected to be contributing from your particular standpoint or viewpoint or you know the kind of the task you have at hand uh, yeah. so i guess there are sort of a number of different levers which uh, you could work with um, to to make sure that climate action is integrated in within your structures and here again i think it's really worthwhile to 
to highlight the work of the coalition of finance ministers and and really try to recognize the leadership of Finland here in sort of providing this kind of space for finance ministries to come together to compare notes on you know how to structure yourself and how to to make sure that you are having those kind of um, institutional having that kind of institutional setup which helps you deliver on on Paris targets. Yeah, thanks. Um, we had a couple of questions in advance on kind of developing countries and finance for developing countries. And I think you all touched on this uh, briefly in your opening remarks. In particular, we had two speakers on um, recent webinars, one from Bangladesh and one from Guatemala, both saying how they their countries, um, you know, they're very relatively very small in terms of being polluters themselves, but disproportionately hit by climate impacts and they're desperate to make sure that the commitments that have been made in terms of funding um, are met uh, because they you know for them this is kind of an existential threat to them. Um, what what reassurance can they have then that that financing is going to be delivered? Um, and I think you've, I think Christoph, you touched on this in particular in terms of being more transparent about progress that's being made both by governments and by um, financial institutions. But I'm going to ask all of you going into COP because I think the Egyptian um, presidency are making this a big focus. And what guarantees can you give to developing countries that the finance is going to be made available that they so desperately uh, need? Christoph, I'll come to you first on this. One. So. I can only answer that with a with an eye on the private sector, and that's obviously mobilizing private fines has been um, less than expected. I would say when the hundred billion goal was um, agreed upon, so it's I think of key importance to to um, accelerate that. And there, obviously, blended fines approaches are of super importance, but it's also to I think it's for each jurisdiction in developed countries. It's their job to identify the barriers um, that are probably very domestic. And I can give you an example of a barrier we identified in Switzerland. So we we um, updated our um, financial regulation uh, roughly five years ago, and there the focus was very much on consumer protection. So you um, you obviously don't want um, retail clients to invest in non-liquid products. Now, the, the downside of that is that most actual primary uh, finance uh, impact investments are illiquid. So obviously this means there's a complete crowding out for the retail or fluent market of impact investments. It's only focused on as uh, institutional investors, uh, qualified investors um, and um, et cetera. And that's something that is a worth a political discussion. What's the trade-off? Because usually a lot of people um, would want to invest, but they don't have legally the opportunity to do so. So I think that's an area we're very keen on on um, um, delving in uh, in more to see or to address that trade-off. Thanks, Christoph. Sarah, your thoughts on kind of what assurances you could give developing countries as we go into the next COP? Um, I'm definitely echoing the, the private sector role here. They can definitely do more. And we need to we need to enable them to mm. to do more. So we need more robust and predictable policies as a public sector, and we need to make sure that the economic fundamentals are in place, so so that we can de-risk the sector for for the private sector and and create that enabling environment that I was talking about. But of course, financial engineering like blended finance tools and and green bonds they are also important. So. So we need a holistic uh, approach to this. So we need all the tools and policies that yeah. we can have. But um, yes, it's it's important that we deliver on those goals. And I'm I'm really hopeful when it comes to this this year's COP because it has this big focus on this yeah. climate finance and adaptation. So just to especially. unpick that a bit further, what are the kind? What are the specific things that kind of Are looking for that they don't see at the moment so what what how can government create that more enabling environment well i think we we need to assess the risks better and i think what was highlighted last year in cop 26 was the was that or the minister said that they they need concrete numbers they need to see uh the actual impacts of climate change in order to Kind of better understand the big picture. So, so I'm 
I'm really looking forward to see see concrete risk assessments and and modeling tools and and things like that. Um, yeah, and yeah, probably just tools and and incentives to deliver on those pledges that are already made. I'm not sure if we need any more pledges, but actual concrete tools and policies. So, Matthias, your your thoughts on what more. Uh, Insurance can we give to developing countries that they are going to get the financial support they really need? Well, I think very much in line with what both Christoph and Sarah already outlined. I mean, we're, we're working, um, we, we presented as donors what we call a delivery plan ahead of COP26, where we outlined when the 100 billion goal would be met, uh, and it would be met in 2023. And I think sort of that's the kind of message which will which we will continue to bring across also um, at uh, ahead of COP27. Um, uh, and I think sort of what we also outlined in terms of the, 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 our approach to climate diplomacy and the, the usefulness of all countries having those kind of, you know, everyone, all countries need to choose their own model, but, you know, based on, on, on their own systems. But I think sort of building on the kind of elements I outlined when it comes to, you know, setting the right kind of policy in place, ensuring that you have the finance to implement that policy and then also that kind of innovative technology which which sort of facilitates the implementation and of course we as donors are ready to engage with with partner countries when it comes to providing the finance which countries themselves cannot secure through their own national budgets uh, and applying the uh, the Addis Ababa development finance principles, for example, when it comes to national resource mobilization. And I think ultimately a key point here is sort of at, as, as has been highlighted, sort of securing the right kind of investment climate for countries to attract the investment needed, you know, be it domestic or international investment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course that speaks not only to climate generally, but sort of to more to, to development as well. Uh, and what kind of institutions do you need to have in place? Sort of how, how what is it that, that investors are looking for? Uh, and I mean, as has been highlighted as well, sort of what are the barriers to investments today? Uh, and again, not only for, for climate action, but for development more generally. So I think that sort of, I would hope that, that kind of, those kind of elements would be ever more present also in the conversation on climate finance, that it's not only about sort of delivering on the 100 billion, which we of course will do and shall do and need to do, mm. uh, but also uh, how we can support each other in delivering that kind of investment climate, which attracts all the investment necessary for making, uh, making the transition a reality. Well, on that assertion that we will do, we should do, and we absolutely have to deliver on the 100 billion, um, who can actually, you know, where in the international community can we hold governments, can we hold uh, financial institutions to account if they don't deliver on their commitments? Ultimately, what are the levers that the international community has to ensure that these commitments are uh, met? Christoph, your thoughts on this? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of pressure, I think, increasing pressure from citizens. You know, we're seeing activism around the world. That's definitely driving progress. But at the end of the day, if we don't meet, meet those commitments, that, you know, what, what can be done about it? So um, the 100 billion goal, that's a commitment from countries, not from financial institutions. I think there the goal, the focus is more on um, getting their private and net zero commitments they made as part of GFANS and as part of SBTI, a science-based targets initiative, et cetera, to hold them accountable. And I think yeah. it's two different levers. I think the country um, part, that's part of UNFCCC um, um, process. There's uh, increasing scrutiny from, uh, from NGOs and civil society on that. Um, I'm sh maybe there's, um, I, I wouldn't know how to, to, to further add to that pressure that's already there, I think. In the end, it's when it comes to countries, it's domestic political process. So each of each of the jurisdictions and countries have their uh, uh, particular domestic um, circumstances and um, the political needs to be there to increase. And if that's not there, then it's it's very little the government can do if the, if the political will in the back is missing um, sometimes. Um, on the private sector side, it's it's slightly or very different because there, as mentioned, the focus is on really establishing financial institution um, um, transparency on their commitments and on the transition plans. And I think there, they're even more 
they're even more um, um, have a even bigger equal or big, equal, equal, even bigger exposure to public scrutiny and scrutiny by NGOs and by clients and by investors. Yeah, thanks, Crystal. Matthias, your thoughts on that? So, Crystal saying that in one way, governments can hold financial institutions to account for meeting their net zero commitments, but who's going to hold the governments to account? Well, I mean, I, I would agree. It's it's within the UNFCCC process that, I mean, the, that's where the goal was set. Uh, and that's also where uh, where we are expected to um, present answers on how we are con on, on how we are delivering to the goal. Uh, and I mean, I, that will be the case now also at COP27. Um, mm -hmm. And it might, might just be worth worthwhile highlighting that uh, we will have a dedicated UNFCCC report on the delivery of the, of the 100 billion for the first time now presented to COP27, um, which sort of builds on other types of reports which have been out there for quite some time, and not least the, the OECD have been uh, producing a report uh, for the past couple of years uh, annually on the delivery of the, of the 100 billion, but this is then the first time that there will be a dedicated UNFCCC report on this. Um, but I think you're also sort of the on, on speaking of accountability, and you know, I think that sort of also relates to the wider aspects of accountability of implementing the Paris Agreement. I mean, uh, the the 100 billion goal is a collective goal, but, but equally is also the the 1.5 degree target is a is a sort of a collective goal, uh, which we have set ourselves to reach uh, jointly. Uh, so there's sort of the there's a kind of a similarity there between sort of the structure of those two goals and that we as a global community have, you know, promised to to deliver on 1.5 and we as donors have also promised to deliver on 100 billion. Uh, and then um, using the COP process to to highlight the kind of progress that we're making in terms of delivering on those goals. So um, that is what I expect to see also at COP27. Thanks, Matthias. Uh, within the coalition um, of, of finance ministers, you said they, you know, share good practice, they kind of help capacity build. Is there also pressure amongst some of them if they don't feel maybe that in some areas people are doing enough? Do they kind of push each other along in that respect as well? I, I would hope it's positive pressure. Um, yeah, I, I, I do think we have very good uh, relationship amongst the coalition between the members and also I would like to highlight the importance of the institutional partners and the, their expertise in, in providing this capacity building and, and training programs and, and other, other methods to, to deliver on this course. So, so yeah, we're definitely working on this in the coalition. Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, we've had a question come in from Richard Johnstone who has asked, is there a risk that finance is actually the limiting factor to climate action as opposed to political will or other factors? Is finance going to be the limiting factor? Sara, what do you think? I think you're gonna say, hopefully not, but I'm gonna come over to you on this one first. I, I personally believe it, it's not. I, I've had this question before as well and um, I think it's uh, they are they are interrelated, of course. But I, I wouldn't one doesn't exist without the other. I, I think we need both, and I think that's why it's important that the the finance ministers their their role is strengthened and they get the official mandate to mm. to actually deliver on this goal. So, so yeah, I would I would be pro finance on this. Thanks, and I get. I mean, we talked about the post-COVID kind of packages, but there's also a risk in this moment in time, when, you know, when we're going through energy crisis, when countries are feeling the cost of living kind of challenges as well, that that political will maybe fades slightly as, as people tend to focus on domestic priorities as well. So as you say, maybe the two uh, will be linked. So Matthias, I'm going to uh, come to you uh, on Richard's question. Do you think finance will be more of a limiting factor and political will. Yeah, I, I'd very much share Sarah's assessment on this. That um, I mean, and, and again, maybe just looking from a from a private finance perspective uh, initially. I mean, the sense I get, at least, and when I when I talk to, to at least to Swedish financial actors, 
there's not a lack of finance and there's no lack of interest from private actors to be investing in climate action, um, but rather sort of it, there is a, there is maybe then a perceived lack of a project pipeline uh, to invest in uh, and you know and that might be sort of a global phenomenon not only that it's uh, uh, lacking in, in particular countries so um, but then of course even if sort of on a, on a more general level that there is finance available um, there there of course are a number of factors which need to come in place for that finance to flow and I mean, we've been discussing some of them already. And, I mean, and political will can definitely be one of those uh, sort of to, and I mean, from my perspective, that would entail setting the kind of targets that uh, would uh, give the clear market signals as to which direction you as a country are heading in, you know, setting your, your net zero targets or even your short-term targets for, for 2030 and so forth. Um, but then also sort of what, what more general barrier or potential barriers would you, would there be for investment um, in climate in particular uh, and you know investment more generally as well mm -hmm. uh, so even though that the finance might be there and not being sort of the barrier to to driving climate action there might be other types of barriers in order for, sort of to facilitate the flow of that finance so i think yeah. i mean I, I would agree with sarah that there are you know there's there's not sort of one or the other. It's it's yeah. a multitude of factors which need to come into play in, in order for the finance to flow. It comes back to that, creating that enabling environment as much as possible. Christoph, did you want to add anything? To yes, I um, fully agree with both what Sarah and Matthias said. I would like to add three things, actually. Um, the first one is um, when you talk to development experts, often investments in developing countries um, uh, with a focus on climate action are less risky than they're originally perceived. When you look at the, the, uh, the risk return characteristic of multilateral um, development banks. So I think it's also an awareness building and capacity building mm -hmm. for private finance that they have, that they build confidence in that regard. Mm -hmm. The second thing is financial flows will react immediately when the right incentives, um, as Matthias mentioned, the right policy signals or the right incentives such as carbon pricing are set. So I think, um, and, and financial institutes are phenomenal at assessing transition risks. So the more clear and stable policy environment is, and the more clear it is that if you invest into brown assets, you increasingly will have an increased transition risk, the less likely such assets will be financed and the higher the capital at, um, risk of these investments um, is. And it's at the moment, we kind of ignore that part, the internalization of externalities, on a global scale and we focus on the targets on the private sector commitments and that kind of works but we cannot expect to or it's it's it, it's increasingly an issue if the targets lead financial institutions to be so far away from um what actually policy signals and incentives offer in the market so it's important that we also we also back that up um with with setting the right incentives hence the importance of carbon prices be it implicit or explicit and therefore i very strongly support the work of the oecd inclusive forum on carbon mitigation approaches to build this global stock take of implicit and explicit carbon prices thanks christian uh, I can't believe how quickly the time has gone. We've probably got time for one uh, more round of questions. Uh, if you do have another question in the audience, please send it in now. Um, but if not, uh, one that came in earlier, um, which was just about your expectations for COP27. So both in terms of what do you expect to come out of COP27 generally, but what would you like to see specifically when it comes um, to kind of financing of climate action are you expecting any new developments are you expecting any um, surprises so i am going to start with matthias thanks well in terms of of expectations from cop 27 i think it's first worth maybe just highlighting the the complexity of the multilateral environment at the moment i mean not least given the russian invasion and sort of the, the consequences that that brings i mean you, you raise the energy crisis but also i mean fertilizer crisis the the cost of living crisis the uh and the food crisis which which has hit many countries so that, that of course provides sort of a, a a somber background to uh to the meeting as such 
Um, but uh, looking to what we would hope to be seeing sort of the outcomes from COP27, I think it's worth highlighting the what we call the, the mitigation work program, something which was uh, decided at already at COP26 that COP27 should decide on. Uh, and we see that the importance of that in light of the large, of the huge uh, emissions gap, which we need to be closing even more quickly than we are today. And we see the so-called mitigation work program as sort of a key vehicle for doing that, where parties can come together sort of to compare notes on sort of, for example, the policy environment that they're putting in place, but also the various initiatives which have been launched. I mean, GFANS has been mentioned here, the Coalition of Finance Ministers as well, how all these various initiatives support climate action in countries globally sort of to, yeah. to accelerate um, implementation of mitigation targets. But I think it's it's worthwhile highlighting also, I mean, not least when it comes to expectations from, from developing countries and the importance of us all as a global com community to be delivering on not only sort of the mitigation targets, but also when it comes to climate adaptation, for example, um, climate finance, obviously, I mean, uh, making sure that we are making progress on the 100 billion and, and what we from the EU side have been requesting, uh, you know, maybe a bit of a technical jargon here, but a specific agenda item on Article 21C of the Paris Agreement. So providing a space within the UNFCCC to compare notes between parties on how we are implementing that particular commitment to make financial flows uh, in line with both the temperature goal and the adaptation goal. But then also uh, what we're seeing, not least as a result of, of you know, the devastating floods in Pakistan, for example, and the increasing focus on what we within the UNFCCC called uh, loss and damage. So sort of the, the very sort of concrete consequences of, uh, of increased mm -hmm. temperatures where uh, both loss of lives and property mm -hmm. as a result of that and how we as a global community can be ensuring that sort of both to the extent possible um, sort of preparing for those kind of events, but also then supporting each other in the light mm -hmm. of such events and how we sort of make sure that we have the right kind of structures in place for that. But I think as an overall sort of overreaching um, uh, outcome and when it comes to COP27 is really to, to ensure that we are still on track in delivering on the Paris Agreement. And as the sort of the mantra was coming out of COP26 that we want to ensure that we're keeping 1.5 alive and that sort of all countries are rallying uh, on that particular target and sort of being yeah. through phasing out fossil fuel subsidies, uh, um, phasing out coal, ensuring carbon pricing mechanisms, and joining together in these various types of coalition, highlighting again the opportunities that we see in climate action and what it brings in terms of new jobs and and economic growth. Thanks, Matthias. So lots of uh, lots of wish lists there. I think for what you want to see, uh, nothing at all that I hope anyone can disagree with. Sarah, over to you. What would you like to see coming out of the next COP? <laughs> Thanks. M many things. Um, yeah, I, I hope that there will be concrete ideas or ideas that can be put into concrete action. I think we already had uh, great progress in Glasgow in that, so I hope that, that that will follow. Then, of course, the the adaptation. The coalition is actually publishing a report on the adaptation, so that will be that will be one of our main focus in there. Um, of course, the loss and damage is a new topic that Matthias mentioned. That yeah. will be interesting to hear how, how we will take concrete action on that. Then I'd like to mention the green transition overall. We, we just had the coalition meeting in, in Washington DC just last week. And there the ministers from all over the world were sharing their experiences with the current current measures and policies. So I'm hoping to continue that conversation also in Sharm El Sheikh this year. Then also there will be the MDB joint facility that will be established for long-term commitments. So I'm really curious to hear, hear how that's gonna go forward. And um, yeah, I think overall, just to hear more about the opportunities and kind of like there's this notion of carbon handprints. We, we mm. tend to talk about the carbon footprint, but I'd like to hear more ah. about the opportunities and frame this as, uh, as also positive because the climate negotiations, they tend to be often too negative. So yeah, so yeah. I've not heard that more. before, carbon handprint. That's a new uh, term I've heard. 
Thanks, Sarah. So echoing, um, you know, I'm hearing echoes of what Matthias said there in terms of definitely an increased focus on adaptation, this new um, uh, issue of loss and damage. So the longer it takes, the more I think that's going to be uh, an issue that needs dealing with. And then also you and Matthias have both mentioned um, looking to the opportunities as well that are available. Christoph, I'm giving the final word to you on COP26. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to echo um, on the negotiation part what Matthias said and, and highlight in particular the importance of um, the agenda point two point on Article 2.1c. I think that that's of key importance that we progress there on understanding what uh, such transparency means on aligning, uh, aligning financial flows. Um, another part is I would obviously see stronger language um, on phasing out uh, fossil fuel subsidies and uh, phasing out coal. Um, uh, stronger than we saw at uh, COP26. And obviously, I'm very interested in the agenda point on a new collective quantitative goal, although there it's the decision is to be made at uh, COP28. So don't expect um, uh, any particular decisions. Mm -hmm. on, on the sideline and not part of negotiations, the most exciting part for me is really the establishment of this net zero data public utility for private sector commitments, which I mentioned, um, it will be discussed at the chief ends event. And um, after that, the database is actually being built. So I'm very excited about that. Um, seeing that so many governments and private sector um, uh, data providers come, came together to, to, to um, establish that. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Christos. So I think you've all ended, I mean, obviously it's very clear there are still big challenges ahead still lots more to be done but you've all ended on quite optimistic notes there I think looking ahead in that you're expecting to see some tangible outcomes from COP27 uh, and also it, building on I think Glasgow making sure that you keep that real commitment from the private sector as well as uh, seeing more action from the public sector and governments around the world. Thank you so much. I'm afraid we are out of time now. Thank you so much to our wonderful panel today. Thank you for giving us so much of your time and our expertise. Um, we have sent a questionnaire out to the audience. If you could take a couple of minutes to fill that in, we'd be hugely grateful. It means that we make sure we give you the webinars that are of most uh, relevance and interest to you. And also um, look on our website. There are lots of other webinars. We've got lots of webinars around COP27 coming up and we've got webinars on other issues such as the one that's coming up uh, tomorrow on upskilling uh, the public sector workforce. But you can see information about that and all our other uh, webinars on the Global Government Forum uh, website. We will be sending a link of this conversation, so the video to everyone who registered and everyone who attended today. You can watch it all again. You can share it with your colleagues. Um, and we will also be sending around an article with all the key points that were raised today in a couple of weeks' time. But to Sarah, to Matthias, to Christoph, good luck at COP27. Um, I hope you all get the outcomes uh, that you would like. The whole world uh, needs you to get those outcomes. So best of luck in that. Um, I hope that we see you very soon on another one of our webinars in the near future. Enjoy the rest of the day wherever you are watching us from. Thanks, everyone, and goodbye for now. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.